political panel, we're joined by Ebony Bennett, the Deputy Director of the Australia Institute, and Kian Hussey, Research Fellow at the Institute of Public Affairs. Thank you both for joining me. Kian, there's speculation of an early election. Anthony Albanese says if Scott Morrison calls for an election this year, it means that he has no confidence in his party. Is that the case? Oh, well, I, I don't really think so, and we'll just wait and see how events play out over the year. Um, what's interesting, though, is, is um, the kind of pressures within the Labor Party. So we've seen a structural decline um, in the Labor Party's primary vote um, since the mid-'80s, and in nine of the last 13 elections, the Labor Party's primary vote has been lower than it was in the election previously. Um, so Labor has this real problem um, that they have to contend with um, because the party establishment is, has become obsessed with climate alarmism and, and identity politics, um, and it doesn't seem to be connecting with mainstream Australians. So I think the big challenges here um, are for Labor and for Anthony Albanese. And Bill Shorten today is criticising Anthony Albanese for not uh, really having a, a policy platform. He said he's got a tiny policy platform. Um, but I think this could be a... Um, that, that Anthony Albanese is taking a note from um, Scott Morrison's um, political playbook um, and trying to make himself um, as small as possible, uh, make himself a small target. Um, but we'll see how events play out over the year. But, but the big thing is, yeah, Labor um, haven't really connected with mainstream Australians um, in recent elections and voters are punishing them for it. Ebony, what do you make of Bill Shorten's swipe at Anthony Albanese for Labor's tiny policy agenda? Do you think... Labor needs to lift its game when it comes to policies and what they stand for. Well, I think there's no doubt that Labor's definitely the underdog uh, in this election, and there's no doubt that all incumbent governments uh, have really had an electoral boost from the pandemic, particularly in Australia, where both state and federal governments are seen to have handled it quite well. But leading into the election, uh, I do think there are still some risks on the coalition side of things. For example, it looks at the moment like it's planning to cut every Australian, every working Australian's retirement incomes by scrapping the legislated super guarantee. We've absolutely zero guarantee for anyone that that's going to lead to pay increases, which is what they're more or less promising. And uh, I think Labor's got some strong ground to attack some of those coalition policies there, but it has been really difficult, not just for federal Labor, but for all oppositions around Australia to attack incumbent governments when there has been such an appetite for bipartisanship, collaboration and working together like we've seen uh, for the most of last year with the National Cabinet. So definitely I think Labor is going into this election as an underdog. But absolutely, Scott Morrison, as the Prime Minister, is able to call the election when he likes, uh, as early as he likes, and... Um, <clears throat> subject to the, you know, to the normal rules, but he can definitely call it early if he thinks he's going to win, and of course he would do that if he thinks the numbers look good for him. Kian, Labor says that there should be changes to hotel quarantine and regional facilities should be used and Australians who are stranded overseas are essentially stuck there and should, more of them should be able to come back home. Do you think that we should be making better use of regional quarantine facilities and should this have done, be done sooner? Yeah, um, I think it definitely would have been a good idea to implement something like this sooner. Um, and, and hats off to the Palaszczuk government for suggesting this. Hopefully they can get um, something going. Um, it, it never really made sense to force people into this hotel quarantine in inner cities where they're stuck in smaller rooms and they can't get fresh air. And there's a risk that uh, if they leave quarantine... Um, then they could spread the virus out into the community. So I think it makes a lot of sense to, to try and make use of regional areas, um, but obviously it will have to be um, planned properly and, and have proper procedures in place. Um, but it will be really good to see more Australians come home. There's still about 40,000 Australians stuck overseas, um, and it should be the number one priority of both the federal and the state governments um, to get Australians home. They've seen throughout you know, last year um, and into this year the um, you know, Hollywood elites being allowed into the country, um, cricket teams being able to come in and tennis players being able to come in. And meanwhile, they see fellow Australians stuck overseas not being able to get um, back in. And it seems like there's one rule for ordinary Australians and another for those people who are you know, the, the elite levels of our society. Um, so, yeah, it would be good to see, to see something on this in the coming weeks. Ebony, I want to hear your response to, to that, but also Australia Day tomorrow, Invasion Day protests are planned. Do you think they should be going ahead during a pandemic? 
Yeah, look, I agree certainly that we need to be doing, the federal government certainly needs to be doing more to return Australian citizens. It's unacceptable that tens of thousands of them continue to be trapped overseas. And, uh, yeah, if we can do it for tennis players, cricket players and movie stars, we certainly should be able to organise quarantine and the returning home of Australian citizens. Uh, when it comes to Australia Day and the protests, I think it's really important to note that this is not some sacred day for most Australians. The Essential poll this week showed that most people are going to celebrate it just as a public holiday. And the Australia Institute did polling a couple of years back that showed that 60% of Australians don't even know the historical event that we celebrate on January 26. And that might include our very own Prime Minister, who seems to think there were 12 ships in the First Fleet uh, instead of 11. So it's important for us to recognise on January 26 that... Aboriginal Australians see this day as a day of mourning. It marked the wholesale dispossession of their lands and then generations of stolen land um, uh, trying to uh, basically ruin and minimise their culture, no access to language, the stolen generations. And even to this day, we see Aboriginal Australians are over-policed, over-incarcerated, and they die on average almost 20 years before the average Australian. So it's no wonder they view this as a day of mourning and attempts to just whitewash uh, Australia's history will mean that uh, January 26 continues to be a festering sore until the federal government really takes to heart the Uluru Statement from the Heart and responds uh, by a treaty-making process, uh, really accelerating the voice to parliament, and we need a process of truth-telling because it's very clear that Australians, uh, a lot of Australians don't understand our own history. Ken, what's your view on the Invasion Day protests going ahead? Well, I think it's, it's definitely a shame, um, to Ebony's point, that Australians don't seem to have a very good understanding of their history. Um, but I would say perhaps that's, uh, we can blame that on our woeful um, schools and universities um, who haven't been teaching um, Australian values and Australian history properly. Um, in terms of the, the protests themselves, um, it's, it's true to form of the Andrews government that they're allowing a so-called Invasion Day um, protest to go ahead uh, while they've cancelled the Australia Day parade. Um, if it's safe for... If the health advice um, it says that it's safe for people to protest and, and that's going to be allowed, um, they're not going to be shut down, then Australians definitely should be able to go out there to the Australia Day Parade and, and celebrate um, Australia Day. We at the Institute of Public Affairs, we've been doing polling um, on, on this issue for the past four years. Um, and in our latest poll uh, of a representative sample of nearly 1,100 Australians, 69%... Um, agreed that Australia Day should be celebrated on January 26, um, and only 11% think that it shouldn't. Only 11% want to change the date. And that uh, figure who want to change the date has remained relatively stagnant um, over the last four years. So it's, it's not a mainstream issue. Mainstream Australians are proud to be Australian. They're proud of our, that our history, the good and bad, um, and they want to get out there and celebrate Australia Day on Tuesday. Something different now. Daniel Andrews has made the Triple J Hottest 100 for his statement, Get on the Beers. This is a remix. Take a listen. We had a case last week. As best we can tell, the dinner party started with one case. By the end of the dinner party, almost everybody at the dinner party had a case of beers. Beers, beers, beers. People simply take this seriously, rapidly. Get on the beers. That's your civic duty. That's what's most important. And that's what must be done. Beers. The song came in at number 12. Ebony, does this show how popular he is? <laughs> yeah, look, I think it's a banger. And uh, I think Daniel Andrews also and uh, Mashton Kutcher should be thanking um, the Melbourne families who uh, strung up their Christmas lights to the tune of this uh, song. I'm really pleased to see it in the Hottest 100. I'm very sorry that it's one of the only songs that I recognise this year. Um, but uh, he's not the only politician to have made the Hottest 100. Pauline uh, Hanson was featured uh, in Pauline Pants Down's um, songs in the past. I think they even made it into the top ten. So uh, it's not unusual. And I think great to see some Australian talent in the Hottest 100. Ken, what do you think about all this? Do you think it's a good thing that he's featured or is it concerning that young people know Daniel Andrews for this rather than maybe his mistakes that he made last year when dealing with the pandemic? Well, yeah, for a lot of people, I guess this is a bit of a light-hearted thing, but um, we can't allow the events of 2020 and, and the performance of the Andrews government to, to go down the memory hole. 
Um, we need to keep in mind here that Dan Andrews' um, actions, he put hundreds of thousands of Victorians out of work. He locked away um, families, kept children home from school. Um, it's exacerbated mental health problems and has caused enormous stresses um, in the community. And, and 800 Victorians sadly passed away. And, and all of that can be um, attributed to his, uh, his government's failures on hotel quarantine and contact tracing. Um, and meanwhile, we, we still don't know who made the decision um, for private security guards to, to um, be involved in hotel quarantines. So uh, it, it's important that we get to the bottom of those issues. The, the Andrews government um, suspended Parliament and suspended our democratic norms um, in 2020, and we cannot forget that. That is all we have time for. Ebony Bennett, Kian Hussey, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Thanks. Thank you. The bottom 20% uh, uh, get nothing. They're really unfair tax cuts. People want to see much stronger action from the government when it comes to climate change. It's no coincidence that we have a wages crisis in Australia. Transitioning to net zero emissions, it doesn't seem like there's much room for gas.